Dying fetus? Yes. How are you, John? Doing all right, man. How are you today? Doing good, man. I'm sorry I called so soon, but uh, I guess all right. we're a little more awake now, both of us, I think. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> how important is uh, how important is coffee for uh, John Gallagher to make it through the day? Man, it's essential. I guess I'm a bit of a coffee addict. I, know you I, mean, I have to have it in the morning. I, I don't know. It, it's it's one of my guilty pleasures pleasures right now. So <laughs> are you uh, not doing are you, much else? Do you uh, do you load it up with sugar and and uh, and cream, or are you uh, black? No, black. <laughs> Straight black. It's too many calories. Otherwise. And you're, uh, yeah, we got to watch that stuff now at a particular age, I think. Hey, man, I know. It's true. It, it's, I've been doing it. I'm, yeah. Have you, uh, yeah, you got to do that. Have you had to, uh, have you tried any particular diets like Atkins or the Mediterranean or you just watch your calories? Um, Pretty much watch calories. You know, don't, the typical stuff, don't eat a lot of carbs. I don't drink soda. I don't even really drink any juice now. Like, no, just water, coffee, beer sometimes, you know. Right. Maybe, like, some cranberry juice, not to concentrate, you know. But just stuff like that, you know, with a no. healthy lifestyle. It seems no to, doubt. No doubt. A couple you know, years ago, I feel better. Drink, no doubt. Uh, a couple years ago, I started drinking sparkling water. And I, I guess it's a... That's, bit of a trend now it's like you know tonic water or soda water and it's got what? the uh, it's got the fizz that i like but without all the extra yeah. stuff now, now yeah, soda, i'm the same way now yeah soda just now soda just tastes weird it's, i know well that's i'm the same way you know i said because that's what it is you know when you start limiting yourself to your drinks and yeah, you can't drink soda anymore, so the only thing you really can have with that fizz is sparkling water, like Perrier or something, and, you know, then you feel like you're getting a little treat. You know, it's weird. It's like you got to play mental gymnastics with yourself, but, but it's weird. Your, your body or your taste buds will adapt to to, uh, to change. You just have to keep going with it. Like, my, you know, like I used to drink coffee with sugar and all that stuff, but, you know, it's then I took it away, and at first I'm like, yeah, this is bland, but then with time you get used to it, and it's like, whatever, you know, and like right now I'm drinking the cashew milk, I'm not drinking the the dairy milk, and you know, at first that sucked, but you get used to it, and <laughs> Totally, I don't, I, uh, yeah, I don't drink the cow milk anymore, primarily because I discovered that uh, uh, I was think cow milk makes me stink up the room. And uh, which it makes you, know, you stink what fart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes it, it, <laughs> it, it. It's one of the key components to me being gaseous. So um, no shit. And I, I, that's it does kind of do that to me a little bit too. I don't know. Maybe a little bit lactose intolerant or something. I don't know. That's what they say. I mean, I I notice if I when I eat ice cream. Um, yeah, me too. It speeds up your digestion and stuff. Next thing, yeah, you like have to take a shit pretty quickly. Yeah, my wife. Thereafter. My wife makes me sleep on the couch if I eat ice cream late at night. <laughs> Who wants to sit? I wouldn't want to. I I sleep through I sleep through earth I sleep through earthquakes. So oh my, I mean, probably probably literally you probably <laughs> literally have living out there right in California. Yeah, we uh we yeah we have these things. Have you ever what kind of you have uh what kind of natural disasters are out in Maryland? No, ah uh, man, you know we had an earthquake. Uh, shit, it was probably like five years ago out this way, but we were actually on the road. I was driving through like, I don't know, like Kansas or something like that. And then I got a text from, I believe it was my mother, like, oh my God, we're experiencing an earthquake. I'm like, what? Like, 
I was almost jealous because I wasn't home. I've never experienced oh. anything like that here. Like, you know, like um, occasionally get like a hurricane threat coming in, coming in, you know. But that, eh, it's few and far between, you know. We're kind of in a safe little nook here, sort of, you know. I mean, anything's possible, but something too drastic or happened to me in my life. So. Yeah, I was in Oakland for the uh, the big one, the Loma Prieta one in '89, and oh, shit. Uh, and I was in a warehouse. I lived in a warehouse in Oakland, and uh, when it mm-hmm. when it first started, at first I was like, "Whoa, cool!" And then I looked up, and yeah. I, I could see the the there was these giant wood beams in the ceiling, and they were swaying. Right. Well, that's were, not cool, right? They were swaying. I looked up and I, and I, I guess I must have been in shock because I sort of froze. And that's how, how a lot of people just die because you know, they, right, look, you up, just, they look up and freeze and it drops on them. I guess. My right. Room, my wow. Roommate, my roommate just grabbed his his three dogs and <clears throat> he was out in the parking lot. So we all sort of uh, right. we all sort of respond to things in a different way. Right, that you never know how things are going to go. Like when you're in the heat of the moment, people, that's people always say, "Oh, I would do this, I would do that." But like, what do you really know? Unless you're really in that situation, you know, whatever it is, you know, it might be a, you know, like once I was carjacked when I was like 19. I was trying to be a nice guy and gave some my ride, and then they pulled a gun out on me, and I kind of froze up. I'll be honest, man. I didn't know what to do. And we were just driving down the road for about 30 minutes, and then eventually I just, like, drove into this person's yard and started screaming, and the dude jumped out of, his, out, out of the car and ran off into the woods. But, like, I, you know, when I was, you know, in that situation, I was just kind of, like, frozen a little bit, you know, for a while until I kind of could figure out some way of getting out, but you know, so never give strangers rides. That's one thing I learned, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, you never know what you're going to do when you're faced with this stuff, so yeah. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, um, when did you, uh, how did you first, okay, when did you first get into music and how did you, uh, get into metal who who turned you on to metal I mean um pretty much you know like when I was younger like, like I don't even know me like fucking seven eight years nine years old that kind of age like my uncle would be rocking out to his eight tracks like you know I lived with my grandmother for a while you know and like my uncle lived there when I was young and he was you know listening to Ted Nugent and Black Sabbath and all this kind of stuff and I'm like whoa what the hell is that I'm listening to and I'd go in his room when he'd leave and just kind of check things out and listening to this stuff and I remember Cat Scratch Fever was one of the my favorite um um eight tracks or whatever back in the day by Ted Nugent and and we sold our souls to rock and roll <laughs> the Black Sabbath album uh, vinyl. Yeah, that. And I would just listen to that shit, listen to War Pigs, and like, whoa, this is pretty cool. And so I guess I kind of got myself into it in a sense, you know, like with a little bit of help for him, you know. It, so, and then, you know, I just figured, yeah, I just, I don't know, like it was just really attracted to the music. It really. I don't know, really kind of mesmerized me or something. I would kind of sit there in front of the record player or whatever and just like, wow, I could just, something kind of came over me. And I knew then and there, like, music would be a part of my life in some way. I didn't know what, how it would lay out, play out, but, you know, it just grabbed me. Music did something to me. Always has, so. No doubt. How important is it? How important do you think was the imagery as well? Because we, you know, we listened to, I mean, I, I think an eight track is probably the size of a CD, but definitely yeah, not, yeah, not, not def, definitely not the size of a record. Right. You know, that's imagery was really important, you know, and um, 
Like, I remember looking at the Molly Hatchet albums, like, man, this is probably cool, like, based on the covers, you know, like, <laughs> these guys, <laughs> I thought, this must be brutal. Look at these guys, warrior-looking guys, and, um... An axe, and a... And, a... and then it's like, flirting with disaster, I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> this doesn't match up here. I thought, so, like, yeah, you know, I wanted the brutal image of, you know, that's why I think I've like there's Molly Hatchet covers and stuff. But, um, but uh, yeah, you know, like, I didn't know, back then, I didn't know what I was like, you know, it was like, I was like, this, when, you know, you saw the Black Sabbath record, you're like, man, this is kind of evil, and it kind of gave you, like, kind of a weird feeling. Because I was, I was going to Catholic school and everything. I was forced into that. Like, my parents said, you're going to be a outstanding citizen. We're going to keep you from the ills of society and send you to Catholic school. And so I don't know. It's like when, back then, when you said when you saw some kind of evil, then you kind of viewed it as being like old oh, taboo or something. Like I shouldn't be looking at this. Oh, this is bad stuff. And I don't know. Maybe that gave it a little more excitement. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> Forbidden fruit. I don't know. Uh, how did you? Uh... You, originally, you were a drummer in Dying Fetus. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm definitely not a real drummer by any means. But the thing of it was, back then in the early 90s and stuff, we didn't have a very strong scene. Death metal drummers around here just didn't grow on trees at all, man. <laughs> I wish they did, but it was like, you no. Know, even the best guy in this area at the time kind of sucked like had he had the popcorn double bass to play you know consistently and so it was like man you know I had some songs and stuff and and um, you know I was with Jason and a couple other buddies and I was like fuck it I'll play the drums I actually bought like an electronic drum set and kind of fabricated it myself just with the pads just built built it out this little case a little little, you know, pad set, and I would just try my hardest, you know, to play on that thing, and that's kind of what happened. We made a demo, and, you know, if it was today, I would just, you know, would use, like, a drum machine or use a drum program, and you would, that's what everybody does, you know, and when they're making demos, right, you just make, use, uh, you know, superior drummer or whatever, and create the files and there you go but back then it was just like there was none of that so I just had to make do and try to make something happen That's and that's pretty much how it was you know and then like I ran to this um, this dude at work you know Rob Belton this black guy came up to me I was wearing a I was doing construction or whatever and I was wearing a Morbid Angel Alters of Madness shirt and he comes up oh Morbid Angel they're badass man and I'm like, what? You're black? I, uh, you know, and you're listening to this stuff? This is in D.C., you know? Like, so, yeah, I'm into it. I'm like, all right, cool. So then we started hanging out and, um, and jamming a little bit. And he got on my drum set, and instantly I was like, yep, you're fucking way better than me. So then I just moved back to drums and stuff. So so the drums for me was just a temporary period, just to get things going. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's all. You know, that that that's how determined I was, man. I at all costs, you know, wanted to get this thing going. So I can't imagine that as a kid you 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 thought to yourself, this is something that you wanted to do for the rest of your life, let's call it dying fetus. Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't really think about it that way, I guess, you know when <laughs> You know, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. You know, like right. Nobody thinks about that. You don't think like that. It's like I'm gonna, yeah. You just create whatever band, you know, whatever you're doing, and go on with it. And you don't really know if it's gonna be successful or not. Or honestly, I didn't think it would be. You know, like I thought we would do something, like maybe jam some shows, local shows, like most people do, and and then I would be electrician or whatever rest of my life or whatever doing construction but um we're kind of fortunate that some people dig it so death metal has been 
kind to you. Yeah. As kind as it can be. Sometimes it can be. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. not a, it's not gonna. You're not. Death Metal is not gonna buy you a mansion on the hill, but uh, no. But it, no. It can be. Um, can be a career, and apparently is with you guys. It can be, man. Like, you know, you got to live. Uh, you know, I'm still watching. I'm still buying the bread on sale on Safeway, and you know, like anybody else, like watching their budget and stuff like this. And I'm, I'm not just blowing money hand over fist or something like this. But you can live conservatively with death metal if you do it right. You know. It's definitely not uh, hookers and cocaine. No, man. No, no, not this kind of stuff. Right. No. So you have a new album coming out this month. It's called Wrong One to Fuck With. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. And I suppose with a, a name like Dying Fetus, you probably were never going to be getting on the... Um, on the checkout shelves at Walmart anyway. So that's that's the thing. I was just I've been mentioning that in interviews, you know, just the last one I was doing. I mean that you know, people have been asking about the, why are you using the original logo and all this and you know, why does it have a brutal cover and yeah, you, well there is no record stores now like we used to have the bold logo on the C D so someone could walk in and read you know, and I just see the the pile of sticks. That was the idea of using the bold logo. And, right. But now there's no Walmart. Yeah, right. So it's just, or no no CDs in Walmart. And um. So yeah, with the the title and imagery and stuff, we're just like fuck it. You know, like. But you know, I, I did want to push it a little further than what what came out. Really, I wanted like really intense kind of glory cover kind of something like an old cannibal corpse theme like I was really pushing for it to be extreme but the label weren't going for it they like had they're like no we got to tone it down a little bit it's social media and we get banned on Facebook so we can't have it to be too graphic but somebody will complain you'll yeah lie. yeah or you'll be shooting yourself in the foot you know like we're you know, no doubt. Where it won't be out, won't you know? We won't have all the exposure it could possibly have if you make it too extreme. So we kind of toned it down and a little bit with the cover, and but still, it's pretty brutal. Dying fetus, wrong one to fuck with. I mean, it's kind of extreme metal, and to me, it's just like you know a reflection of today's society. You know, like it's death metal stuff. You know, you got people shooting up the place. You know all over the world every day there's some kind of shooting or, or this violence and we're just a reflection of that you know basically that's what this music is you know that's the way I kind of see it you know that's a very extreme cover without being I know a lot of the death metal bands there's a lot of uh, brutalizing of women in death metal bands <laughs> a lot of uh, you know women with <clears throat> Things shoved in them, and uh, <laughs> this one is uh, this, one, this one is actually more masochism. Than that. What's that? Masochism, I guess it's called. Is that what that is? The uh, I think so. But uh, what what's that? Oh, this album is brutal enough without showing, you know, entrails and. Uh, yeah, that's that's um, yeah, yeah. The it's people sort of, that made it, yeah, leave, so it leaves a little bit to people's imagination if they really want to go look at what her face looks like. Right. And those were real people, I guess. Like, that was, like, it's not all photoshopped. There was our manager kind of helped to direct, you know, this um, place in Hollywood. It, that's a prosthetic head, one dude's holding. Uh, it's all, like, set up just real people not just all photoshop there is is it actually a live person you know pretending to be dead there you know like it's all kind of acted out to make that cover um but yeah yeah i'm curious what they look like she looks like too i didn't i haven't met the person or anything but um that's cool it's it's 
you know, it's it's not too gory, but it it depicts a lot of violence, you know. Yeah, it leaves... so it's extreme in its own way. It's you know. Absolutely. Now, um, <clears throat> you are uh, you are uh, you just announced that you're um, co-headlining the Summer Slaughter tour with uh, uh, the Black Dolly Murder. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, right. That's that's coming up end of July into August. Um, yeah, we got, we received that offer. We're actually on tour with Hatebreed. Um, a couple months ago, we were supporting Hatebreed in Europe, and we had a call from our manager and had to get on conference call with the band, and we we're like, you know, got the offer. And what we were told at that point was just us and Black Dahlia and and we've been meaning to get back together with them and do a tour in the States. We did a nice tour with them in the, in the um Europe in Europe. So um yeah, when we had the opportunity to get back with them and do a tour we're like decided to do so and Yeah, so I'm um, looking forward to this summer slaughter coming up in the next few months, so you also, time. you also are headlining the Bay Area Death Fest here in Oakland too, so you'll be gracing yeah. us, gracing your presence That's, with us for like um, two doses of dying fetus in the Bay Area this summer. That's That's pretty, cool, man. Yeah. Bay Area is pretty intense, man. That's that's one of the better markets for us, for sure. Like Yeah, yeah, I mean it, it's it's always a good time. So we're excited about that fest. There's, man, there's a lot of brutality. Hopefully people are still alive by the time we play, you know, play that night, you know, because it's going to be a lot of bands. Like eight <laughs> bands or something like that, ten bands. Yeah, that's, like that. that's a lot of blast beats. That's a lot of blast beating. <laughs> that is a lot of, that's a lot of growling, for sure. And DNA. that, too. You've uh, played the DNA Lounge many times, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that place is pretty cool. Yeah, totally. And uh, let's see here. Do you... Um, this is album number six. Is that right? Did I get that right? That's number... Six. I believe it's it's like... Oh, number eight. <clears throat> eight, I believe. Number eight. And, and it's been about five years since Reign Supreme. And that seems to be the longest... About the longest yeah. uh, time you've had between albums. Are you just busy on the road or just said, hey... Pretty much... Um, just busy on the road. We, yeah, we did. We had a lot of hectic tour scheduling, and and um, you know, and just taking our time, making sure the album comes out organically, naturally, to where we're happy with it, not forcing anything, because that's happened. And you know, sometimes you just, man, I got to get this project out. You have a deadline or something, and you just kind of scramble and. You know, the, the album isn't really as good as it could have been sometimes, maybe. So we were, you know, wanted to <clears throat> make sure make sure we were happy with our product before it's released. But, but honestly, man, it, it's I feel like, man, it should have been released a long time ago. It's been recorded for like a year or more. So for me, it's like I'm already thinking to new ideas, you know, so we were kind of pushed back with the relapse scheduling. Re- Obituary had to put out their album before ours, you know. Like we were, you know, we we, we um, fabricated our record like right around the same time as Obituaries, and they were they were done a little sooner than ours. So we had to wait before we could release our album a few months, you know, let theirs get out and you know promote it and everything. So. And then, like I was saying, with the cover, that took some extra time, you know, going back and forth with the label, you know, like me not being satisfied. No, you need, there was there was a few different album um, designs that didn't get used, so that took a few extra months getting a cover that I was satisfied with and stuff, so... Yeah, you know, and in, in all long time, this keeps going by, as you know. So, it, before you know it, it, four or five years go by. And, no doubt, no doubt. You know, you're like, oh, fuck, I wish this was out. But, hey, that's what happened, and um, we're happy with it. You know, sorry to anybody that 
you know, I was waiting and we're not like purposely dicking around like, you know, it's just the way it's happened. So. Cool. Just a couple more questions here. I got, um, do you, uh, how much haggling do you have to do with your record label on stuff? Does it have to be approached like buying a car or, you know, do you, you come up then with this uh, and come back to you, you with this to meet halfway? Yeah, it was like, yeah, that's kind of what a little bit of bag was done, and it's kind of unusual. Like, I'm, Relapse are a really easygoing label, you know, like, um, we've been with them for a long time and never really had many problems or anything where we have to, you know, fight something out, argue or anything, but um, really the only haggling that's been done in recent years was, I guess, that cover, that going back and forth with that, that, that was about it, but like money and that kind of stuff. They're pretty, pretty cool with that. And we don't, we have a manager and stuff that kind of, you know, works for us and handles that. So we're not like personally bitching and stuff with them. And, but honestly, there's not much of that going on with our label. That's why we've stayed with them for so long, you know, because they, they just kind of let us do what we want to do free range and stuff usually so that's you know I have heard that some labels kind of you know have a bit of censorship with their artists and stuff so I mean we're happy with where we're at so it's all good cool well thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us do you have anything uh, um, any final thoughts or or that you might want to uh, share with anybody that might be watching or listening to this? Um, not so much, you know, just come on out to someone's slaughter or any show where we're around and hang out and that's about it. Enjoy your life. That's it, man. Live your life and enjoy it. That's all I got to say, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs>